Welcome to our two, uh, Thursday night class. Good to have you all here tonight. Uh, we continue on in the Gospel of Luke. We're now getting into the uh, meat of the Gospel, so we'll begin that tonight, talking about the uh, birth announcement of John the Baptist. So i uh, got a lot of interesting uh, things to share with you this evening, so we'll get right into that in just a minute. Um, let's see, uh, any prayer requests that we might have tonight? <laughs> really? Oh, wow. All right, so Sanders family. Okay, okay. All right, good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Darcy's brother passed away. Yep, yep. <coughs> so we keep, uh, keep him in prayer. Okay. All right, so uh, let's get started then, as we normally do, with a moment of silent prayer, giving us the opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1 9, the rebound technique to ensure the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. So, if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <coughs> And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this day in praise and worship to glorify you and your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for all that you have given to us and provided for us. We thank you for all the physical and spiritual blessings that you poured out onto us and our families. And we ask that you continue to provide for our every need in the coming day as well. And Father, we thank you for our church, our local assembly that gives us an opportunity to freely come and worship and serve and learn your word. We ask that you continue to have your hand upon our ministry. Watch over, protect, and guide it, and lead us to serve you as we are edified in our souls by your word. So, Father, we pray for our great nation. We ask that you continue to watch over it, protecting and guiding it, being with our president and his family, protecting and guiding them, leading him in all his decision-making authority on our behalf, also being with our military, our policemen and firemen in the local area and nationally. We ask that you be with them and protect and guide them, and we thank you, Father, for their service and for their sacrifice. We pray for uh, those military men who had the plane crash uh, this uh, past day. And we ask that uh, the recovery go well and bring healing to those who are wounded. Father, we also pray for the memorial service for uh, ex-President uh, Bush. And we just thank you for his service and sacrifice for our country. And we ask that your name be honored during the memorial service tomorrow. And that you bless his family in their time of mourning as well. As well, Father, we pray for Darcy and her family. and. Uh, loss of her brother, and we ask that uh, you give them strength and comfort and guidance in the coming days, and also allow the word of your son Jesus Christ to be proclaimed during the memorial services in the coming days. Also, we pray for the family of uh, Sue and Barry's neighbor, Sandra, who passed away last night. We ask the same for their family, and we thank you, Father, for bringing her home to glory, and we also pray that you give their family comfort and guidance in the coming days in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to be preached loud and clear for salvation. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we have gathered together. We ask that you lead us now to glorify you in all that we do. In Christ's name, amen. <coughs> all right, Cheryl, are you up for it tonight? All right, you could come forward. He is Lord, He is Lord, He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's my Lord, he's my Lord. He has risen from the dead, and he's my Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, and please be seated. All right, thank you very much for the doxology. Now let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1. <coughs> and here in uh, Luke uh, chapter 1, uh, we've already noted the introduction, the preamble, or the prologue uh, that Luke gave in the introduction to this letter and the purpose for writing it and how he went about writing it and also who he wrote it to. So we've noted all of those things in verses 1 through 4. Now we see the first piece of information that Luke is sharing with Theophilus and also with us now, the church, through the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. And the first thing that it begins with, from a chronological standpoint, but also historical, is the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist. And so when we look at verses 5 through 25, we have that scenario and that story. And as we uh, see in the outline of the Gospel of Luke, it starts with the announcement of John the Baptist, then the announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ. Then we go back, or Luke goes back to uh, the birth of John, and then a little bit about his early life. And then also, then it goes back to the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then the story goes on from there. So it's interesting how it goes back in group first the actual birth process and the results around it so we'll note that as we get into uh, all of these but first and foremost it's the identification of Jesus Christ as the son of man and the great mark of the identification of Jesus Christ coming into the world was the forerunner the one who would be crying in the wilderness teaching the people that Christ is the Messiah and the Messiah is coming and that is the person of John who we call the Baptist. And so we have the announcement of his birth, who was uh, prophesied to come into the world in the form of Elijah, which we're going to see uh, in just a minute. And he came to be the forerunner of our Lord Jesus Christ and allow people to know and understand that the Messiah was coming. So the first thing that Luke does in this, in this account is give us an historical record and give us the historical of what's going on. And he does that by identifying the king of Judea at that point in time. And as he calls him, he calls him Herod the Great. We're going to read this in just a minute. But basically, he talks about Herod the Great first and foremost to give text or the time frame and reference as to when these things were occurring. And Luke does that as the great historical writer that day would do. They would give a sign of the time in which they were writing about by talking office, whether it be uh, depending on what nation or what, uh, what the um, most well-known uh, leaders were at that time in period. So Luke does the same thing as the great historians by identifying Herod the Great here as the ruler and king of Judea. Let's go back into verse 5 and let's read it. <clears throat> and he starts off, as I said, by saying, In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a certain priest named Zacharias, now, what's interesting about the English translation of Zacharias, in the Greek, it's actually Zechariah, okay? I don't know why they decided to call it Zacharias. Maybe to differentiate himself from the great prophet, but again, we, I'm going to call him Zechariah as we go forward, all right? So a certain man, uh, a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it came about while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division. We'll talk about that in just a minute as well. According to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him. 
standing to the right of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I don't like this translation. I'm going to share that with you when we get there. It says, while in my NASB translation, while yet in his mother's womb. Well, I'll talk about that right now, because in the Greek it's ek, and then it talks about mother and then womb. Basically, ek means out from, away from. So this isn't while he was in the womb. It was after his birth that he would receive the indwelling and filling of God the Holy Spirit. Not in the womb. That is not what God does. Because, again, there's no soul life inside the womb. Now in verse 16 it says, And he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. Yet it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn <clears throat> the hearts of the fathers back to the children. There we have a quote from Scripture. Old Testament scripture, and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which shall be fulfilled in their proper time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. So again, t could not speak. And it came about when the days of the priestly service were ended that he went back home. And after these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way of the Lord, or this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. All right, so that's the uh, storyline in regard to the birth of the announcement of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Take you through that because there's a lot of important principles and precepts and also give you some more understanding of the historical uh, background and significance of all that is going on here. As I've already noted, remember he started by saying in the days of uh, King Herod, this was Herod the Great. And that uh, was given, uh, this title was given to him, again, Herod the Great and also Herod, King of Judea. That is specifically given by Luke because Herod had sons that followed in his kingly line, and their name was Herod as well. But yet they were not king of territory. Oh, it's talking about a that is called in history great and he reigned from 37 bc to about 4 bc for about 41 years he reigned over the people of israel but emperor of rome remember he was not they were not an independent nation at this time the authority of rome is rome uh, controlled their land and their region <coughs> What's interesting about Herod the Great is that he was not a Jew, which is interesting, but he converted to Judaism so that ultimately he could take this rulership role and position. In fact, his bloodline goes through Esau. And remember, the Judaism goes from Isaac and then down to Jacob. Jacob and Esau were is not in the line of Judaism. They, he, they are not. They are Semites, but they are not Hebrews. They are not Jews. King Herod came from the line of Esau. Therefore, truly, he's not qualified to be the king of lineage. But yet, 
because of his marriage into a family that uh, converted to Judaism and also had some other then you know ponied up with uh, uh, with the uh, 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 emperors of Rome authority to be the ruler and king over the people of so that's a little background of uh, King Herod and uh, giving us a historical time frame of when these things took place. As we understand that Jesus Christ was probably born, we'll talk more about this uh, when we get there, but some believe about 4 B.C. was the earliest stor- uh, time that he was born, not just at 0 B.C. There's no such, you know, 0. Because <laughs> remember, they went to B.C.s all the way up to 0, then from 0 to 1 uh, was the first A.D. So in any case, uh, you know, these people don't think that it actually fell on the time of the birth of he was BC or even some even, even say all the way up to 4 AD but we'll talk more about that in just a minute but it was during that time period and towards the latter stages of the uh, rulership of Herod that these things were written again what it what uh, what was important about uh, giving us this uh, time period is also saying that this was Herod the Great, okay, the King Herod. And this was a time when the people of Israel were what? Under the authority of Rome. He was a puppet king. He wasn't a true king. They weren't an independent nation. And sad to say that the people of Israel had not received a prophecy or word from God for four years. And since the book of Malachi, they have not heard anything in regard to God's plan for the people and nation of Israel. But yet we do see something fantastic in the book of Malachi. We see several prophecies of Jesus Christ. And also we see a promise of the coming, a prophecy of the promise of the coming of Elijah. Let's turn to Malachi. Again, if you go uh, uh, to the book that's prior to the book of Matthew, Again, the last book of the Old Testament, you'll find Malachi. <coughs> and this is in uh, Malachi, is a short book. It's only four chapters. But we have some great prophecy. We have some uh, great uh, lessons for the people and nation of Israel and for us today. But in Malachi chapter 4, we'll go back to verse 1. It says, Behold, the day is coming burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. And interesting, that branch, again, Jesus Christ is the branch of Jesse. And again, they would reject him. Then in verse 2, it says, But for you who hear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. That's talking about Jesus Christ coming forward. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. And you will tread down the wicked, for they shall be ash under the soles of your feet. On the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. And that even goes into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now in verse 4 it says, Remember the law of Moses, my certain servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. So here we see a promise that he would send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord, which really is the day of uh, millennial, uh, uh, the tribulation, which is prior and ushers in the millennial reign. But prior to that, Elijah is going to come. And we believe that when we look at the book of uh, uh, Revelation, we see an Elijah-like figure, maybe one of the two great witnesses during the tribulation that are proclaiming salvation in the Lord and repentance to the world and the people of Israel. But at the same time, we find John the Baptist is that he is noted as being in the like manner of Elijah several times within the first few chapters of the Gospel of Luke and the other Gospels as well. So when we talk about John the Baptist coming and being the forerunner of Jesus Christ, we see him in the like kind of Elijah being the one that uh, speaks and teaches repentance for the people and nation of Israel. Let's go back to Luke chapter 1. 
<clears throat> so it's interesting that we see this setup that in the, you know, talking about the days of King Herod, which were the dark days of Israel. They weren't an independent nation. The Lord hadn't spoke to them for 400 years. This kind of a doom and gloom message that Luke was writing in the days of King Herod. The days when we were apart, the days when we had from the Lord. The day when we were under the authority of the Roman Empire, we were not an independent nation. Nation. These are the days that are in view. Then it talks about a certain priest named Zechariah or Zacharias of the division of Abijah. And what's interesting about Abijah, too, when they translate it into the English, Greek and the Hebrew, it's actually Abijah, uh, or excuse me, Abia. And basically, that is one of the divisions or the families that were of the priestly uh, people and nation of the Levitical priesthood of the nation of Israel. And what we see here is John's father, Zechariah, whose name means the Lord remembers, going to get this great messenger where God, uh, where that messenger communicates all the great promises that the Lord had given to the people of Israel. God remembered his promises and he sent this, this uh, person, John the Baptist, who is then the like of Elijah, preaching and teaching salvation and repentance to the people of Israel so that God could restore to basically come this great in as it says, he's in, in the division of this uh, family line. What they would do, and I'll talk in a minute. Uh, well, let me see. Okay, we can, well, we've, we've kind of already talked about it. Let's just jump over. We're going to come back to this, but let's jump over to uh, uh, verse 8. It says, Now, while it came about, while he was performing his priestly service before God, in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So Zechariah, who is one of the priests of Israel, basically was chosen by lot. And again, however they did it, whether they, you know, draw straws or, you know, through some kind of material or dice or something like that, and they would decide who would go in and uh, do this at this point. Zechariah. Again, we talked about lots before in the uh, past couple of weeks. This from eternity past, who on whom the lot is going to fall. And God put it as part that Zechariah would be chosen in this instance to go into the holy place inside the tabernacle, burn the incense, and then in that place send Gabriel to give him that great announcement. We see the preordained plan of God, the pre-designed uh, plan of God for the life of Zechariah and the life of John the Baptist and all of this coming together. Now, <clears throat> in regard to the casting of Lot and in the line, uh, let me just uh, get my slides to move here. Come on, slides, move. There we go. Okay. When we talk about this allotment, what's interesting about this is that in that day, there were probably somewhere around 20,000 priests throughout the nation of Israel. Lots and lots of priests all over the nation of Israel because it expanded and grown tremendously over the years. Now, what we see also from uh, First Chronicles, which I've given to you in the notes, and uh, uh, it's noted here talking about the division of the priests and where he came from. But basically, we see in Chronicles there were 24 divisions of priests. Here they call lots of priests. And basically, in those 24 divisions of that, in each one of those divisions, there would be anywhere from four to nine houses, or we would say families, okay? Different families with their own patriarch that ultimately came under the one of the 24 divisions of this priestly nation, okay? And of the four to nine family of priests or house of priests within a lot, there would be about 150 priests per house. So again, you could take 150 times four, or you could say you could take nine times 
uh, 150, and that would be the number of priests inside that house, okay? And then you just multiply the numbers going up, and you see you get somewhere around 20,000 priests that could be selected. Now, as part of the ordinances that God gave to the priests uh, the Le- and to the Levitical priesthood, is that every year, one of the houses, okay, and the families of priests within that would be selected two weeks out of the year, not consecutively, but throughout the year, each of them would serve two one-week stints, okay? And they would do their priestly service. Again, because they had so many priests, so they just kept rotating these priests through and in and out. And so therefore, now of the four houses of priests, you get about 100 you got to figure out who's going to go in and burn the incense before the altar out of all those individuals. And so they would cast lots. And the one that would come up according to the lot, that would be the one chosen to go in and burn the incense. What we also can take away from that, again, unless somebody's very lucky and they hit the numbers all the time, okay, very few individuals got to perform this service, which was a high, holy, and sacred service. So this was very unique and very rare for somebody, even one of the priests, to go in and to burn the sacrifice and the incense before the altar inside the tabernacle. So again, you kind of just look at some of the mathematics and some of the probabilities and God putting all of this together so that Zechariah would be inside the tabernacle, burning the incense at this point in time, having been chosen lot and then sending Gabriel into that place which was a private place because only the priest would be in that room again inside the holy place and a picture of that in uh, in the temple and tab but I want to talk about a few more things but so again it would be a private one-on-one conversation God put it all together <clears throat> so we see this individual having uh a, a, a priest uh, being in the priestly line, God choosing him to be the one that would have uh, this on the Baptist, and we see him being chosen and the message being delivered to him in a highly unique way. What we also see is that the wife Elizabeth, as we've read in uh, verse 2, uh, well, actually in verse 1, it says, And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So not only was Zechariah from the Levitical priesthood, but also from uh, 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 the daughters of Aaron. We see that Elizabeth came from a priestly line as well. So we have a great heritage between these two people, both of them being in the priestly line, coming down from Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. A little bit something about them. Now, when we talk about Elizabeth, her name, actually, when we translate that, the meaning of her name means my God is an or is my oath. And again, my, uh, my God is my oath or my God is an oath. But either way we translate it, basically what it comes down to mean is that she is a worshiper of God. And that's what the name Elizabeth, that is my wife's name as well, that means that she is a worshiper of God. As my wife is a beautiful and wonderful worshiper of God on a daily basis. Hopefully I get some credit for that later on. Okay. But later <laughs> but <laughs> I just blew it. I should should I can't just give a compliment, can I? <laughs> I can't just give a compliment. All right, but no, she's a beautiful woman. But in any case, a worshiper of God is what the name Elizabeth really comes down to mean. So we see these two individuals. We see further definition of these two individuals as being righteous before God. So continuing on, as it says, and they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Now, this is talking specifically about these individuals. Everybody's a sinner. It didn't mean they didn't have sin in their life, but yet they walked without breaking the law as consistently as they possibly could. didn't mean that they were perfect, but yet they were righteous individuals and walked with God as much as they could. And to walk with God meant they would apply His word, apply the law of Moses within their lives. So righteous before God is what's in view there. Then it goes on 
in verse 7, and they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. So it's interesting that see is the righteousness of these two. Then in verse 7, we see something about their birth. You see, John's parents live faithfully. This is not a message of salvation by works and saying, oh, because they kept the law, that's why God chose them out. No, they believed in God. They believed waiting for the Messiah. We're also going to see a prayer was answered. You may think it was a child, but I believe, and from the context of what we see, it was probably a prayer for the Messiah to come and rescue the people of Israel. So again, they were looking for the Messiah. These two individuals had a great faith, and they believed in their Old Testament scriptures. They rightly interpreted what the law was all about, of the coming of the Messiah, of God's salvation for Israel and the world. But we also see in this message, when we look at verse 7, talking about her being barren and childless, Back in the ancient days, if somebody was barren and childless, it meant that they were typically meant that they were accursed. And they were shunned from society. And they were treated poorly in society because if a woman could not give birth, oh, you must there be something wrong with you. There must be some sin in your life. And we see in the Old Testament scriptures that sometimes that was the case. If a woman was barren, it was the result of sin being in her life. So the people in their legalistic arrogance would really push that onto all women who were barren. But yet, as I'm going to show you in a slide coming up in just a minute, Elizabeth is in a great line of other devoted, righteous women that were barren until God worked miraculously. With and again, this does not mean that she was a sinner. And ultimately, it's talking uh, about her being righteous so that we wouldn't take away from the picture of her being barren. If Luke didn't see her being a righteous individual, we'd just look at her barrenness in her, and ultimately she deserved you know, to be barren and have no children. <clears throat> but that is not the case. Again, her childlessness is not a result of sin. Verse 7, we also see that not only uh, was she barren, she was well beyond the age of bearing children, probably beyond the age of menopause, whenever that might have been within her life, 50, 60 years old. Who knows? We don't know the age of Zechariah and Elizabeth at this point in time, but we just know she was beyond the age of bearing children. So what we also take away from this is that we see the like nature. We see the likeness in Abraham and Sarah. Remember Abraham and Sarah, and God had made a promise to them that I was going to send you. I'm going to make you a great nation. And from your seed, I'm going to make a great people. And there were many promises that were given to Abraham because of the seed that came from him. Yet he too and Sarah, his wife, were beyond the age of childbearing. But yet God worked miraculously in both of their lives. And we know their age is to be about 90 and 99 to 100 years old, Sarah being 90, Abraham being about 100 years old. We knew their ages from being well beyond the age of childbearing, yet we see God miraculously working in their life. That's going to come up in uh, what's going to happen a little bit later on in this scene. You see, they're forerunners. There's a type. And because of great patriarchs like Abraham and Sarah and other great devout women who were barren until God worked miraculously in their life, they should have understood God's promises and God's opportunity and blessings. And they should have understood when Gabriel came and said, or, and Zechariah specifically, should have understood when Gabriel said, you're going to have a son, he should have said, oh yeah, God can do that. He's done that many times before. Why can't he do it with me? But we see something coming up uniquely uh, that causes a little bit of problem for him. As I said, Elizabeth is a member of other devout women like Sarah in Genesis, Rachel, Hannah, who gave birth to the great prophet Samuel. And we see in uh, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, we see the line of Abraham, the line of Israel coming down. Of these women were barren until God miraculously favored them and worked in their life and allowed and they all gave birth to great men of God and great prophets. Great spiritual leaders came from them. 
So as he said, uh, made the same promise to Zechariah, and then Zechariah conveying that to Elizabeth, they understood, <clears throat> and again, Zechariah not right away, but understood of what God could do and the great promise that God had given to them, even though they were beyond the age of childbearing. Then as we continue on and look at verses 8 through 10, it says, Now it came about while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of the division, which we talked about, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. Probably, uh, most scholars believe, uh, the second of the incense burnings. Every day they burned two uh, offerings of incense to the Lord. This was probably the second one in the afternoon, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he went in to perform his priestly service. He went in and in the burning of the incense. Remind you, when you uh, when Israel would burn the incense inside the holy place, what was it a reminder of? Their prayers that were offered up to God. And how God accepted them as what? A sweet-smelling aroma. So it's interesting that Zechariah of the priestly service was chosen to go into the Holy of Holies to burn the incense that represented the prayer of the people of Israel that was given up to God through the smoke that God then accepted and was a sweet-smelling aroma to him. And then we see in the scene that Zechariah had offered up his own personal prayer to God during this time period and Gabriel comes in and says your prayer has been answered so again all of it coming together great imagery of what's going on and God was hearing the prayer of the people of Israel they were praying for the Messiah to be sent he heard their prayer now it was time to deliver on that prayer and by way of imagery when we look at the tabernacle and again this is uh, the imagery of uh, Herod the Great's tabernacle, which was actually the, uh, I believe, the third of the tabernacles that were built, Solomon's, and then the rebuilt uh, during the uh, times of, uh, uh, of um, uh, I'm forgetting, uh, uh, Nehemiah and that group uh, of individuals. And then that got destroyed, and then Herod built even a greater tabernacle. And in that tabernacle, again, they would enter in, and there would be two rooms inside of that tabernacle, the first room being the larger, called the holy place. And inside of that, there were three articles, the table of showbreads, the golden lampstand, which uh, we s uh, call the menorah today, and then also the altar of incense. <coughs> And then there was the great curtain that divided the Holy of Holies from the holy place. And back in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat lid that was upon it. And uh, that was the place where uh, God would come, Jesus Christ would come and dwell amongst the people. So here we have Zechariah in the first room and the altar of incense. And uh, you can see somewhat by the picture there, but uh, try to imagine it yourself. But if you start from the opening door and you go all the way back straight ahead, straight ahead was that altar of incense, and then behind that was the Ark of the Covenant. But then you place two articles on each side, the table of showbread and the golden lampstand. Again, the sh uh, bread on the right, the lampstand on the left. And when you look at that picture of loan, what do you see? A picture of the cross. You see the straight line, you come in the door, the altar of incense, the, the, uh, the altar, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mercy seat in the background. And then on each side you see the two arms stretched out called the table of showbreads and also the menorah or the golden lampstand. So that in itself gave a great picture of the cross and all the articles spoke of what Jesus Christ would perform upon the cross. This was the place of the announcement of the forerunner of Jesus Christ, the one that announced that the Messiah would finally come inside this tabernacle. And again, this is now an inside look as to what that tabernacle could have looked like. On the right, the table of showbread. On the left, you have the golden uh, candlestick uh, uh, or the, uh, uh, the lampstand. 
and then straight ahead you have, again, you kind of see both of the pictures there, a little blurry, uh, but you, I think you can depict it. First you have the altar of incense, then the curtain, and then behind the curtain you have, again, the altar, uh, the great mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant uh, with the mercy seat on top of it. So this is the place, and uh, you see the priest serving at the altar of incense. This is a great depiction of what Zechariah would have looked like at this point in time, officiating over, burning the incense. And you see at the ground a, a censer uh, 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 that uh, they would bring in. And basically they would altar outside where they would burn the sacrifices, commit the animals, and then burn them, offering them up to the Lord. They would take coals from that fire, and the priest would bring it in to the altar of incense, and with the sacrificial coals, he would come in and put them on the altar of incense, offering up the prayers to the people, uh, 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 to God for the people of Israel. So we kind of find some interesting aspects in regard to our prayer life, is that we have no prayer life before the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you don't first recognize the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you cannot pray to God. What does that mean? Unbelievers have no prayer to God other than, I believe in Jesus Christ. Any other prayer that an unbeliever offers up goes absolutely nowhere. At the same time, for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't confess your sins other than the naming of your sin. God does not hear our prayers directly and answer them directly because we have not appropriated the altar of sacrifice first. We have not appropriated the cross where Jesus paid for our sins through the confession of our sin. So therefore, when we confess our sins, now we can offer a prayer unto God, whether it be petition prayer, whether it be thanksgiving prayer, whatever the prayer may be. It to God where he hears it and answers it. And it's not a sweet-smelling aroma to him. God may, by divine uh, province, answer that prayer, but again, it's not a direct answer to your prayer. It's an indirect aspect of the plan and will of God. So, in any case, uh, we see the priestly service. We see what Zechariah was doing. And basically, the main prayer that the people of Israel, notice were gathered outside, and they were all praying. And as they were preparing, again, uh, you know, the priest, it, it, uh, the coals in, they would burn the sack, or put it on the altar, and then take the incense that was made out of frankincense and basically burn that, offering up a great smoke to God. And then they would back out of the holy place and then come out to the people. <clears throat> and there was something specific that would occur at that point as well. But the fact of the matter is everybody was gathered there to pray. And they were praying for what? The Messiah, the deliverance of Israel, for God to keep his promises. And Zechariah was the one in this instance that would go in and offer that up for the people through the, sac through the incense, offering that to the people, giving the prayer, Lord, send your Messiah. Lord, deliver your people. So it's interesting when we talk about Zechariah praying, we may think that he's praying because of the direct answer that Gabriel gives him, that he was praying to have. That might have been a prayer a long time ago. You see, at this point in time, they both will well be on the age of childbearing. So why would they pray for a child at that point? There's no need to. And they would have given up the ghost, as we would say. They would have given up praying for a child at that point. So when the prayer is answered, it's the prayer of the people and also the personal prayer of Zechariah and Elizabeth for the deliverance of Israel through the Messiah. So it's fantastic how we see these things come uh, together where basically he would be praying for a Messiah to come. Now in verses 11 and 12, it says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing in to the right of the altar of incense. And again, the right hand is what? The, the position of a power, the position of authority. We see in some of the accounts of the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, there were two angels that sat on each side, just like there were two angels on the mercy seat. But in one account of the Gospels, there's only one angel sitting at the right side. Maybe it was Gabriel, the archangel, 
maybe it was Michael who we're going to see uh, as the other archangel that is mentioned within Scripture. But Gabriel here is the one that is mentioned, and he is at that position of authority and power. Then it says, as Zechariah, uh, it says, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear gripped him. And again, basically, natural response, okay? <laughs> if you're somewhere, and you're supposed to be the only person in there, and all of a sudden there's somebody else there, wouldn't that startle you? How'd, that, how'd you get here? Because he knew nobody else should have been there. So again, we see the natural response of Zechariah at the appearance of Gabriel. Did it in a very miraculous way that also startled him. But what we see here is, first and foremost, he's not identified as Gabriel. That comes later on in these passages. But first and foremost, he's identified as an angel of the Lord. And that's angelos in the Greek. And again, in the Greek, it's A-G-G. When you have a double G, it's like an ing in the uh, English language. That's why we translate it N-G. And then you have E-S. That does mean messenger. So here's a messenger of the Lord. Again, Kyrios, the Lord. And what we find about this uh, title, the angel of the Lord, is that it's a very generic title. Yes, it always stands for messengers that come from a heavenly base, but sometimes it's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's called the angel of the Lord. In this case, it's Gabriel, and he's called the angel of the Lord. Many times we see an angel of the Lord coming and making an announcement, like the one that came to Joseph and announced that your son will be the Messiah. His name will be Jesus. So don't get rid of Mary. Doesn't give his name, just says the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord appeared before the shepherds who were out in the wilderness. We don't have a name for that individual, just that it's an angel of the Lord. So both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see this title, Angel of the Lord. It's very generic in its use. Sometimes it talks about Jesus Christ because the angel of the Lord was in the burning bush that met Moses up on the mount. Other times we see the angels that visited Abraham before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah to give a message to Lot. Angel of the Lord is applied in that instance as well. So again, sometimes it's Christ, sometimes it's just a message. We see this message, Gabriel, we're going to see him uh, being identified in the coming verses, as we've already read. But we also see this individual showing up to Daniel as well, also being identified as an angel of the Lord. It was a unique angel that was given a message from God to deliver to mankind, as all the angels of the Lord are identified as doing as such. A specific ambassadors, emissaries, messengers that God sends. And in this case, the one being Gabriel. Now as we look at verse 13, it says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your petition has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you will give him the name John. Now, by reading that passage, your prayer has been answered, and your wife is going to you know, uh, give birth to uh, this individual who you're going to name John, you may want to put two and two together and say they were praying for a baby. But again, they were well beyond the age of childbearing. And yes, maybe because of their devoutness and knowing the Old Testament scriptures, they were continuing to pray. Well, if, he, if God gave Abraham and Sarah a baby, he could give us one too, even though we're well beyond our age of childbearing. But common sense kind of leads you to say they probably would have given up the, you know, given up the ghost, as we like to say, given up uh, their uh, petition by that time. Because, okay, if it was going to happen, it would have happened early on in our lives. But what we do see <coughs> is the prayer being answered of what? The announcement of the Messiah coming to the people of Israel. The forerunner. So, John, again, we see the name of John the Baptist. Again, Ioannis is, uh, Ioannes is uh, how you pronounce that in the Greek. And basically that means the Lord has given, or the Lord has been gracious. And that's what the name John actually means. we got a John in the audience, my son-in-law, and that's what your name means. Okay, so God's been gracious to you. God's given us you. Uh, so, in any case, uh, a blessing uh, to the people. 
And that's John the Baptist and what his name represents, that ultimately that he is a grace gift from God to the people. And in that grace gift, he's going to be the forerunner and the one that announces the coming of the Messiah. All right, now as we look at verses 17 through 14, and in those passages it says, And you will have joy and gladness. So there it uses two of the Greek words that talk about that rejoicing, that, that inner happiness that is uh, expressed in exaltation. And in fact, that word gladness talks about exaltation, rejoicing outwardly. And it says, And many will rejoice at his birth. We actually have three different Greek words that identify this type of joy and happiness that will be expressed. Two for John and Elizabeth, and then one for all the people. But we see all of them rejoicing in a fantastic way. It says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from or out from his mother's womb, not while in. That's absolutely a horrible translation. And it probably uh, was done so that people who line up with that, uh, you know, that uh, life is inside the womb from the moment of conception. Again, there's no soul life in the womb. There's physical life in the womb, but no soul life in the womb. That doesn't happen until God the Holy Spirit breathes breath of life, the nashama, or breaths of lives, nashama, into the nostril of the baby as it comes out from the womb. Then it has human life and soul life given to it. Inside the womb, it's a physical extension of the mother's life, okay? It has no life of its own until the Holy Spirit breathes life into that baby. So again, uh, you know, out from your mother's womb, and he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is what he's going to do, and that comes straight out of, uh, again, Psalm chapter 51, verse 12, where it talks about restore to me joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Again, this rejoicing, this gladness will be because salvation is now coming into the world. The Messiah will now come who will save man of their sins, and he will be a blessing to all the people. Now what we also see is in verse uh, uh, 15, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Basically, it doesn't say that. But when we compare Scripture with Scripture, and we, uh, as I have up on the board between Numbers chapter 6, verse 2, that it gives this, uh, this whole process that is then applied in Judges to Samson and 1 Samuel to Samuel, and then in Amos chapter 2 to many special servants of the Lord, this is what's called the Nazarite vow. And this was a special vow that any believer could take. And they would, what they would do is vow to do something for the Lord. And while they were uh, performing that task, until it was accomplished, they were to do what? Wine, drink no liquor, that uh, are spoken here, and also what's not spoken here, but is in Numbers 6 2, not. And so they would do that while they were fulfilling their vow. But the fact is, is that when the vow was finished, they could go back to drinking liquor. They could go back to eating what they wanted to eat. They could then cut their hair. We, in fact, see Paul ha taking a Nazarite vow during his missionary journeys. But we see that in number 6-2. Samson was one in the type of John the Baptist that would be a Nazarite and be under the Nazarite vow coming out from his mother's Womb. And in fact, you can read this on your own, but read Judges and also read Numbers 6-2 and the other passages, because in the Old Testament, it's translated appropriately. When you come out from the womb, not while you're in the womb, but out from it. So Samson, uh, who is that famous uh, uh, Nazareth, uh, who took that vow and was given that vow uh, to his vows, he was none of these as well 
it off, and then uh, captured him, and that's the rest of the story. But in any case, <coughs> here we have John the Baptist. He that vow of the Nazarite vow out from the womb, therefore it was for his entire life, just like Samson. And basically, what that Nazarite vow was all about was consecrating somebody, separating them from the pack, as it were, to special service and work for our Lord. And so therefore, when they would take the Nazarite vow, there was service and sacrifice that they would be committing, being consecrated unto God to fulfill a special purpose. And John the Baptist was one of them. He had a special purpose. And therefore, as uh, Gabriel talked to his mother and father, he was under that Nazarite vow throughout his entire life. And he went through his entire life and ministry. Then we also see not only would he have a Nazarite vow to fulfill the special purpose, but he also had a uniqueness that would be filled. And remember, in the Old Testament, they were not permanently in by God the Holy Spirit. That is a church age doctrine and church age fact that only church age believers have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit from the day of their salvation to the day that they go home to be with the Lord. In the Old Testament, it was a temporary indwelling called the endowment of God, the Holy Spirit. But yet, and, and, and the other thing that, which many of you know, is that not all believe the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. During the church age have the permanent indwelling and have the potential for the filling of God the Holy Spirit at any time throughout their actual life. But yet the Old Testament saint only happened to a few and it was not a permanent indwelling. But yet for John the Baptist, it was. And that gives us kind of not only a special ministry that he had, but tells us something about him. You see, he was a great transition. Just as Jesus Christ was a great transition from the age of Israel to the age of the church, the church age dispensation. He was a great transition. And he also demonstrated that power and the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, to perform his ministry. Something else about this individual in the type of Elijah is that he didn't come, John the Baptist didn't come with all kinds of miracles and wonders. perform all kinds of miracles the way Elijah spoke the word of God, and he evangelized, and he spoke repentance. He taught the Messiah. He spoke about salvation for the people of Israel. And many were turned in the spoken word that he was giving to the people, just as many turned as Elijah spoke the word of God to the people. So we see fantastic analogy here in the form of Elijah being filled with God the Holy Spirit, not to perform great signs, miracles, and wonders, but to teach the Word of God so that people would come to salvation. That was his ministry of being a forerunner of Jesus Christ. And the phrase, as I've already given to you, and I won't go through this uh, in any further detail, but while yet in his mother, is absolutely a wrong translation. It should mean out from his mother's womb, meaning from the time of physical birth, not the time of conception. Okay? So we just get that straight. Now we also see that he was that important transit, uh, trans figure, as I just said. He transitioned them from the age of Israel, leading them into the kingdom age, leading them into the church age then of believers who would then walk from the age of Israel into the age of the church and be part of the church dispensation. And through this filling of the Holy Spirit that was permanent for him, it was another figure of that transitionary type of ministry that he had. And what we see in verse 16 is that his ministry was what? To the Jews primarily, to the people, the, prom the people that God promised the Messiah to come to. But yet he could witness to anybody, but it was primarily to the Jews and to the Israelites. And that's where he spent his time in his ministry. And as it says in first, uh, verse 16, And he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. 
That talks about him evangelizing the and nation of Israel. That was his primary goal, to lead them to know that the Messiah was about to come, that the kingdom had been offered to them. And let me just get these two points in, and then we'll uh, wrap it up, and we'll finish this up on uh, Sunday morning, is that in verse 17, act as the forerunner of Christ. And we see that in Luke chapter 1, verse 76, and also in chapter 3, verse 4. And he came in the manner of Elijah. To make the people ready so that when Jesus showed up, they wouldn't be like, who's this guy? You know, John was witnessing. He's about to come. He's about to come. He's about to come. And then when he showed up, they were, they were supposed to say, here he is. John was just telling us about that. He was conveying the Old Testament scriptures, telling us that he's here. We should accept and recognize Jesus for who he is. Many did. Unfortunately, many did not. But again, that's part of the rest of the story, as you know. And then again, as I said, the power of the Spirit came. He came as a great, he came as a great spokesperson, a great messenger, as Elijah was that great prophet of old. And what's even interesting about the story of Elijah is that when he was taken up to heaven by means of a rapture, the gentleman ministry was a gentleman by the name of Elisha. And Elisha, double portion compared to Elijah. And he did twice as many things and performed twice as many miracles. Almost say it, twice as much power than Elijah did. Who do you think more about Elijah than you do Elisha? And it's not about the miracles and the signs and the wonders. We're going to talk more about that on Sunday morning when we talk about Zechariah and where he fell down a little bit for a temporary uh, period of time. It's not about the signs and miracles and wonders. It's about what? And by hearing is how we believe. Not by what we see or feel, taste, or touch. By the word that is spoken to us. And the word that Elijah spoke, the word that John the Baptist spoke, was the word of the Messiah who came to provide salvation. And unfortunately, some rejected, but fortunately, many received that word and came to salvation. All right, I'm going to leave it off there. I've got much, much more to talk about uh, in regard to this. I know I've filled you up uh, with quite a bit this evening already, a lot of detail in these things. Uh, but in any case, we'll talk more about this on Sunday morning, and we'll talk a little bit about Zechariah and his epic in this story. All right, so let's uh, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We praise you. We worship you. We glorify you. We thank you for sending us John the Baptist as the forerunner for your son, Jesus Christ, to announce the way of the Messiah. We thank you for keeping your promise to the people of Israel and to the people of the world by sending him into this world to pay for our sins. So, Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and we ask for your travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.